Chapter 2. A Letter from Carnlock. In late 1845, a letter arrived for the Marchioness of Londonderry from one of her agents telling her that it looked like something was wrong with the potato harvest in Carnlock, or as he put it, something that looked like cholera for potatoes had arrived at Lady Londonderry's estates about 30 miles north of Belfast. At exactly the same time as Lady Londonderry was getting this letter, farms all over Ireland, large and small, were noticing the same thing. A journalist for the Belfast-based newspaper, The Northern Whig, went to see what was happening. He reported back to his readers. Mostly every potato field that the eye could light on has the appearance of having been blighted by frost and in most instances the petals of the blossoms are observed to wither and shed in the course of a few hours. Two years later... Lady Londonderry had stopped collecting rent from their tenants in Carnlock and on her estate at neighbouring Ballymacaldrick because nobody could pay it. A soup kitchen established in Newtonards, the once prosperous town in the shadow of the Londonderry's Mount Stewart estate, was doling out 100 gallons of soup every day to the hungry. Whatever was wrong with the potatoes, the blight spread through Ireland, decimating the food supply, plunging the poorest families into starvation, then working its insidious way through the country, communities, placing intolerable strain on the entire supply chain. In Belfast, another local newspaper, the Belfast Vindicator, ran the editorial. It is unhappily too evident that Ireland is now suffering under an awful calamity. Famine, disease and premature death prevailing to some degree everywhere in this island. Accounts multiply of destitution and suffering and death in their most appalling forms. The cry of distress is becoming louder every day. The prospects for the future are very dark. The famine, for that was what it was was at its most perniciously deadly in the south and west of Ireland, particularly in the provinces of Connaught and Munster, where its impact approached the apocalyptic. A million Irish people died of hunger. That's one out of every eight in the population died of hunger. Two million emigrated. On the day that those letters had started arriving from Carnlock to Lady Londonderry and to farmers all over the country in 1845, the Irish population stood at about 8.5 million. On the day I'm recording this for you in 2023, it's still not back up to 8.5 million, it's 6.8. And that's combining Northern Ireland with the population of the Republic of Ireland meaning that the entire island of Ireland still has not demographically recovered from the impact of what happened in the 1840s. And the lore of the famine, the cultural shared memory of its horrors, settled. Two generations later, Maggie McKinley was one of many ordinary people interviewed by historians about the famine. Her words are read here by actress Ashley Montgomery, who uses, Maggie uses the word minded. Um, it's a Ulster and also a Scottish colloquialism. Minded meant remembered, kept in their memory. My grandmother minded the famine. She said there was a boat come into the bay here that took over a hundred people, whole families. She had five or six sisters and two brothers and they all went away. A whole lot died on the boat going over though. From here, I think they mostly went to Eastport and Maine. A lot went to Boston. But in some senses, particularly compared to other parts of Ireland, the North and Belfast in particular are anomalies in this collective commemoration of the famine in Ireland's cultural memory. In a very large part, this was because with its different topography, neither Belfast nor Ulster were as badly impacted by the famine of the 1840s as other parts of Ireland. Belfast was an affluent coastal town with an economy increasingly developing towards trade and industry rather than agriculture. And yet suffering is almost never stationary. 
The scale of horror in the 1840s was so enormous that even areas not directly initially affected by the failure of the crop, the potato crop that by the 1840s formed a huge part of people's diets, particularly in the West and South, were nonetheless changed by it. And Belfast was no exception. The failure of the potato, the blight, was the first in a series of agricultural disasters that multiplied thanks initially to terrible weather. The famine, it's true, as I've said, hit the north less than it hit the south and west, but the areas of the north that it did touch were also the areas of the north least socially and agriculturally equipped to cope with it. The northern counties, for instance, of Cavan and Monaghan saw their populations fall by a third due to death and migration. The north's western county of Tyrone fared almost as badly. The soup kitchen previously mentioned in the town of Newtonards was in County Down, traditionally one of the wealthiest parts of Ireland. And there were horrible stories from other counties in the north, such as the privately run soup kitchen in Donegal that would only give porridge to the hungry if they converted to Protestantism. Other private soup kitchens where the rare treat of meat to the free food was added to the food on Friday, in the knowledge that the Catholic Church prohibited its members from eating meat on Fridays in commemoration of the crucifixion of Christ. While some landlords, like Lady Londonderry as mentioned, stopped collecting rent, others refused to do so and allowed their agents to evict families who didn't have enough to feed themselves, let alone make rent. Protestant-run newspapers in Belfast criticised these hideous attempts to persecute the poor further, or anyone who tried to find a way to only give charitable food to hungry Protestants rather than anybody who needed it. And the people of Belfast established the Belfast Relief Fund to raise money to help not just hungry communities in the north, but also those in the western county of Mayo and the southern city of Cork, both of which were particularly badly impacted. Before the famine of the 1840s, Belfast had been an overwhelmingly Protestant town, specifically, as mentioned, Presbyterian. But the complete collapse of the rural infrastructure, coupled with the evictions from estates by those who couldn't pay their rent, led to an influx of immigrants to Belfast seeking food and work. This migration from the impacted county saw the first numerically substantial Catholic community settled in Belfast. And they settled mostly in and around the town markets and later in the western section of Belfast. Now there had been a large enough Catholic community there before the famine to require the building of a suitable church in the town centre near the markets, the absolutely extraordinary St Malachy's Church on Alfred Street. If you're visiting Belfast, go and see St Malachy's. It's so underrated even by people who live here. It's Tudor era inspired architecture with those Baroque flourishes is really something. But uh, back to the topic at hand, in the wake of the famine and its aftermath, The number of Catholics living in Belfast increased substantially, altering both the religious and, in the future, political demographics of the town. Why do I say political as well as religious? Well, it really is to do with what we appreciate as the impact of the famine, and any medievalist or early modernist will tell you that famines were a recurring horror in Europe before the 19th century until industrialization and capitalism made mass food production possible, after which the famines seem to have receded into history. Because of that, some revisionist historians have attempted to argue that the Irish famine of the 1840s remains as notorious as it does because it was the last mass-scale famine in Western Europe. There might be something to that argument, but In my opinion, not much. There are two other more important features that set apart the famine of the 1840s. The first we can tell from its subroquies, the Great Famine, the Great Hunger on Gortamore, and Rakhil, the Hard Times, the Bad Times. The hunger of the 1840s was greater in scale and thus deeper in suffering than many of the other famines in Western European history. There is no question that what happened in the famine years was horrific, especially in the West and South. But to go back to that comparison, 
the comparatively unaffected north and certain parts of the east were only comparatively unaffected if compared to the rest of Ireland. Compared to the rest of the United Kingdom, even Belfast was staring down the barrel of a gun loaded with absolute horror for most of the 1840s. And it's that comparison that matters to what happened next. Not compared to the rest of Ireland, but to the rest of the United Kingdom. A key tenet of the Act of Union of 1800 had been that Ireland was as much a part of the United Kingdom as the leafiest suburb in southern England, as Margaret Thatcher would famously put it a century later, Northern Ireland is as British as Finchley High Street. And yet, a mere 40 years into the Union, one million Irish people had died of hunger. According to the Union, they were one million British citizens at a time in Britain's history where it was the wealthiest country on earth, and not by a close margin. How had that happened? How do, do, do a million people in the United Kingdom starve to death in the 1840s? Would the government have reacted so appallingly if the famine had swept through Berkshire, their critics asked, or Kent, or Essex, or Hampshire? Would the government have sat in London and piously proclaimed their free trade platitudes while a million died in Sussex, and the hunger-drawn survivors evicted from their homes flooded into Knightsbridge? For critics, the famine shone a devastating, damning, unforgiving light on the Union. To its critics, it proved that the Union was a charade, a farce that had ceased to be funny, when a million lives were snuffed out on its watch and then asked why the people of Ireland were so angry. Now, it should be pointed out that in the years that lay ahead, the mythology about the government's response was to fudge some of the details and outright misrepresent others. It's not true, for instance, that the government went through Ireland deliberately harvesting up the corn and exporting it themselves to ensure that as many died as possible. The government devoted after 1847 on an almost religious level to the doctrine of free trade instead refused to interfere, that's how they put it, not intervene, interfere in the free market. So they stood back, allowed, facilitated, failed to disincentivize the exportation of food out of Ireland by private companies and traders. As the country buckled with collapsing food supplies, the government point blank refused to introduce tariffs or duties that would at least encourage the companies to keep the food in Ireland and sell it there. So while they didn't skip through the countryside stealing food, they nonetheless completely and reprehensibly failed in their duty to provide for their most vulnerable citizens on a scale that boggles the imagination. The government's policies allowed Irish food to leave Ireland during a famine. They knew that's what their fair, fair trade policies were doing. Free trade policies, sorry, not fair trade. Fair trade. They knew that's what their free trade policies were doing. But even then, they wouldn't change them. Any relief the government sent to Ireland was too little, too late, too ineffective. It was like using a cork to try to dam the hole in the side of the Titanic. Members of the government apparently even got annoyed when the young Queen Victoria sent £4,000 of her own money to a famine relief charity. The government griped that the Queen's actions had shown them up and that thus they were perhaps unconstitutional. That, by the way, is what British cabinets say when the royals say or do anything that's, that vaguely shines a light on immorality in the government's policies. Unconstitutional. So not only were the government in the 1840s not doing enough to help, they were angry with anybody else trying to do something. Particular loathing was reserved in Ireland for a civil servant called Sir Charles Trevelyan, who dispersed famine relief money and emergency food supplies far more efficiently during a food shortage in Scotland than he did with Ireland. When the government doubled down, and claimed harvest failure was a natural act, an act of God, as Trevelyan notoriously put it. The Irish journalist and lawyer John Mitchell 
played by Danny Cunningham, put pen to paper with absolute fury. Mitchell argued that through their actions, the government may as well have killed the famine's victims themselves, and that it it had been the government's callously inept response to the problem that turned the blight into a famine. A million and a half men, women and children were carefully, prudently and peacefully slain by the English government. They died of hunger in the midst of abundance, an abundance that their own hands had created. It is quite immaterial to distinguish those who perish in the agonies of famine itself from those who died of typhus fever, which in Ireland is always caused by famine. Further, I have called it an artificial famine. That is to say, it was a famine which desolated a rich and fertile island that produced every year abundance and superabundance to sustain all her people and many more. The English, indeed, call that famine a dispensation of providence, and they ascribe it entirely to the blight of the potatoes. But potatoes failed in like manner all over Europe. Yet there was no famine, except in Ireland. The British account of the matter then is first fraud, second it is a blasphemy. The Almighty, indeed, sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. For some, Mitchell's commentary was flamboyant and misleading. Despite what he said, there had been other shortages of food in Scotland, Scandinavia and Eastern Europe. It also was not true that there hadn't been famines in Ireland before. There had been a particularly terrible one in different circumstances, but a terrible one that happened in the 1720s. So there were details in what Mitchell said that weren't historically accurate, but for many others reading what Mitchell wrote, he nonetheless had hit the mark. The government then added to its skyrocketing unpopularity by notoriously refusing to relax the penalties for those desperately caught stealing food to feed their families. Once again, siding with those exporting it, and failing to distribute corn, government corn, quickly enough themselves. The desperate men were caught and deported to Australia, and it appeared to the government's mushrooming number of critics as if, confronted by one of the most appalling humanitarian catastrophes of the century, their government was doing everything it could to frustrate any attempt to soften the famine's impact. And this was immortalised in perhaps one of the most famous Irish songs, The Fields of Athen Rye, which imagines a conversation between a heartbroken wife whose husband, Michael, is due to be deported on an Australia-bound prison ship the next morning after he was caught stealing corn for their children. To sing this, I am so excited to welcome to Single Malt History for the first time, Emily Rose, a friend of mine and a singer-songwriter from Belfast. You can find out more about Emily Rose at her website, www.emily-roseweddings.com, and also on her Instagram, emily underscore rose underscore weddings. And also, of course, on the ubiquitous Facebook. I am delighted she's here, and I'm sure you'll agree this is a really a special and beautiful recording of the first two verses of the fields of Athenry. By a lonely prison wall I heard a young girl calling Michael, they are taking you away For you stole Trevant's call so the young men see them all Now a prison ship lies waiting in the bay No lie in the fields of Athen Rye Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing We 
have dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Adirai By a lonely prison wall I heard a young man calling Nothing matters, Mary, when you're free Against the famine and the crown I rebel, they cut me down Now you must raise a child with dignity No lie the fields of Adarai Where once we watched the small free birds fly Our love was on the wing we had dreams and songs to sing It's so lonely round the fields of Adirai Tellingly, the Fields of Athen Rye is now generally regarded by many Unionists as a nationalist song. Now, in part, that, that is because later versions of the song do incorporate modern Republican terminology. Culturally, however, the Fields of Athen Rye helps pinpoint a painful moment in which the Unionist cause was, for many Irish people, finished. The 29-year delay in Catholic emancipation had already counted against the Union. The 1840s killed it. Who, Irish nationalists argued, could possibly still believe the Union's claim that all four countries in the United Kingdom were equal to one another when they looked at how the government had responded to Ireland in the 1840s? The Union was a pious lie that failed to offer any help when it was most needed. One man who held such a view was John Martin, a politician from Newry in County Down, who joined the pro-independence Young Irelander movement in the 1840s. Arrested but acquitted, Martin, played here by Caelan Carragher, defended himself by telling his accusers that he and many like him now believed Irish independence was essential and in the best interests of every Irish citizen, regardless of class or religion. My object in everything that I have done has been simply to establish the independence of Ireland for the benefit of all the people of Ireland. Aristocrats, clergymen, judges, professional men, in fact, all Irishmen. I sought that objective first because I thought it was our right. Because I thought and think still that national independence was the right of the people of this country. And secondly, I admit that being a man who prefer a quiet life, I never would have engaged in politics if I had not thought it necessary to do all in my power to make an end of the horrible scenes the country presents. The pauperism and starvation and crime, and vice, and hatred of all the classes against each other. I thought that there should be an end to that horrible system, which, while it lasted, gave me no peace of mind. For I could not enjoy anything in my country, so long as I saw my countrymen forced to be vicious, forced to hate each other, and be degraded to the level of pauper and brute. This is the reason I engaged in politics. Unionism did not die. However, it is perhaps revealing that it grew stronger in the areas of Ireland least impacted by the famine. And there were nuances too, lost in the retelling. There always are when history becomes part of a memory. Some critics felt that with its vast wealth, the Catholic Church could and should have done a lot more than it did to help ease the suffering during the Great Hunger. Others argued that the British government had started with better responses until the general election of 1847 kicked the Tories out and brought into power the more free trade obsessed Whigs with Lord Russell as Prime Minister from 1847 to 1852 no relation. The ideology of the respective parties, I should note, was quite different from what they are in the 2020s. 
It's also been pointed out that the government's attitude to the workhouse and or unemployed poor of England was appalling at the time and that there's no guarantee that they wouldn't have been as bone-chillingly indifferent to the suffering of the poor wherever it was in the United Kingdom. Some socialist historians have also pointed out that by seeing this response in national or nationalist terms, uh, Britain or England uh, and Ireland, that we're missing the point of the real lesson taught with the the catastrophe of the famine, which is that a hardline devotion to libertarian or free market capitalism is insufficient in times of crisis and potentially lethally destructive. That has been the argument put forward by some socialist historians, along with the other previous discussions of the role of the church and what happened with that election of 1847. Historians usually grapple with the very best intentions with these issues on subjects as protean as the famine of the 1840s, and it's right that they do so. They're not usually trying to minimalise suffering so much as understand it better, how it was possible, how it was endured, how it was ended. History, like humans, is often complex, that's true. Yet there are moments, I would argue, of near-blinding clarity and simplicity, and I think we can be certain, I personally feel we can be certain, that the people, those millions of people, millions of people who suffered between 1845 and 1849, when one out of every eight people died, and in consequence of that, one in every four left. They cannot be expected to appreciate the nuances of ideology or the impact of the Westminster elections of 1847. All that those people could fairly have been expected to expect was that their government would help them. And in that respect, they were abandoned and betrayed in a reprehensibly hideous litany of ways.